Well, hello there. We are four days into the month of May already here on Good Morning Uganda. And I believe you can totally relate to what I'm talking about. This morning, thank you for joining us once again. My name is Philomena Masko. And of course, it is a full house right here with Robert Nyonyitono and Molen Kenyana. It's a Wednesday midweek happiness. I always want to console myself. You know, midweek, you need to have something going on for you. You need something that is going to bring some happiness into your life. And uh, seeing that uh, we are, this is the second official working day for this week because we know Monday was a public holiday and it's already midweek. So yes, we can have something, we can have the energy to push us through the rest of the days, uh, you know, remaining uh, for us to conclude this week. Now today being Wednesday, it's, uh, you know what, they call it women crush wednesday and i would specifically want to know who maybe roberts and Molin are crashing on uh, this morning because earlier on we were having a conversation and i was telling them well i don't know exactly who to crash on not even myself i feel like there is something lacking but uh, maybe i could uh, seek some inspiration uh, from the gentleman and the lady <laughs> good morning robert a lovely morning to you philo Molin, and of course our lovely viewers thank you so much for waking up with us this lovely wednesday morning now for me i want to crush on midwives in uganda Ooh. those people that usher in a uh, new birth i crush on you yesterday i was watching a story yes. from barara hospital where doctors there separated conjoined twins and uh, i'm seeing this first was in northern uganda about two times there so i'm seeing these regional hospitals then i factored in what happens to these midwives that as they were helping this woman this, they saw these kids being born before even you think about the mother you yes. know so on this wednesday i choose to crush on these midwives that ensure the mother is safe the child is safe thank you so much for aiding birth well there you go to all the midwives out there robert here is crushing on you and hey we appreciate all the work that you do it's not something we take for granted good morning Molin. <laughs> yes, a very good morning to you, Philomena, Robert, and of course I want to say good morning to uh, good morning, Uganda family. Well, it's a Wednesday, and uh, guess what? I am crushing on the ladies that do the cleaning on the roads. If you are an early bird, you realize that uh, there are always women on the roadside uh, doing the cleaning. And uh, oftentimes, we've always wondered, why is it that it's only women that actually do that kind of work? Yes. Oh, well, you're doing a great job, and those are the women I'm crushing on today. But guess what, Philomena, today is uh, the 4th of May. Yes. And if you're in Star Wars franchise, it is that fourth where we say, may the force be with you, or may the force be with you. This started a long time ago, that is 1977, yes. when uh, the first Star Wars movie was actually created. It's always a day that we tag everyone, we create that whole media notice of, yes, we are Star Wars uh, franchise, and we continue to look out for what uh, Lucas Films could actually bring in terms of Star Wars. I know there has always been a struggle between Star Wars and Star Trek. Yes. You can either be a fan of Star Wars but not both. You can't be Star Trek and Star Wars. I, I could have. <laughs> Today could just Star Wars. I don't know. I could have a compromising test and I just decided to take interest in both. I, mm. it's, it's, it should be a provision for anybody and no one should be judged for it. <laughs> <laughs> then you won't, you won't kind of like have that battle because now it, that means you will be in love with the, the two uh, you know movies but you have to belong to some kind of group. So for me uh, uh, the, the force, the force that is in Star Wars might not strike you when you're in Star Trek. So. <laughs> <laughs> but we do celebrate the 4th of May as, uh, you know, the birth of the Star Wars movies. Well, may yeah. the fourth be with you indeed. But also here in Uganda, a lot has been happening since yesterday. Now, speaking of yesterday, we were celebrating the World Press Freedom Day. And I can tell you that one of the most important messages that was cutting a curse uh, among us, all the journalist gatherings that were able to come together and celebrate was a call for unity. We also had the minister himself for national guidance come through to us journalists to come together in a united front to be able to make clear communication with government clearly saying that they don't have anything against journalists so if only they were organized if only they came up in an organized structure it would make the communication and uh, the working with government together and also speaking of government uh, they did say they are about to release Facebook now we know that uh, quite uh, uh, some time ago Facebook was blocked however 
on condition that we don't misuse it. And we know that Ugandans, on several occasions, we have been, we've been found to, you know, misuse social media. We use it for agendas that are not exactly the main intention. So anytime now, if all goes well, things will be all right. But also still happening in Parliament, we've had the Parliamentary Health Commission um, Committee rather come through to say and suggest quite something very interesting. And I would really want to know from you, Robert and Mullen, what you think. They did say that all the money that is ideal uh, subjected to be to build new hospitals should be taken to you know make sure imp they improve the already existing hospitals because about 70 billion Ugandan shillings was set aside to probably build these new hospitals but according to them they feel like this won't be very very necessary matter of fact what should they be what they should be prioritizing are the already existing uh, medical facilities that are just not in a good condition so they should divert that money to these hospitals to make sure they're doing well well, you know, they stock them with medicine. The facilities are already there. They pay the um, the medic, uh, the medical people attending to them. I don't know what you think. Do we really need new hospitals in Uganda, or we should just work on the ones we already have in place? Maybe just to hear from you, Robert. It's very bad to be everywhere yet nowhere. And when the chairman of the Health Committee of Parliament, Dr. Ayume, uh, presented that and said even the money for the specialized hospital, Ruboa, should be diverted uh, to ensure that we rehabilitate these hospitals, I think it's very important because a hospital is not just a building, you know. It's not just a building, that, that big building. It requires facilities, it requires uh, staff there. So we have many health, health centre force where you can walk in, and it's a street beauty, but the services are not there. So when members of parliament come out, say, let's not build more, because we are going to be everywhere, yet nowhere. People still not come to hospitals which are not staffed, hospitals that don't have equipment, even just a microscope, uh, some drugs. So when they say the hospitals they mentioned about uh, three regional hospitals, yes. I'm like, yes, you have a point. Rather ensure there is, there is adequate staffing. Some hospitals are in very dilapidated state. They are leaking. When you go to the labor wards, some even the beds, everything. So don't be everywhere, yet nowhere. You rather be in a few places, but you have an impact. That's why you find that some countries don't even have embassies in other countries. Mm. If you want to go to Switzerland, you go to Nairobi. But when you go to their embassy, it is an embassy. Well, as some have embassies, you reach there and you're like, oh God. <laughs> is this an embassy of a country? <laughs> so we'd rather be in few places with an impact and answering to the solutions that I know. When I go to Mitiana Regional Hospital, yes. I may not have an hospital near me, but if I get transport and by God's grace I'm in that hospital, I'll find treatment, I'll find equipment. You're assured of very efficient Yes, service. rather than saying near us we have a health center, yes. for we have a hospital, mm -hmm. yet at the end of the day I just move in, they just refer me. So it's useless, you can't do it, but now we don't have this, so go to the regional hospital. No, no, no. Well, it's uh, indeed, uh, according to what Robert uh, says, maybe we just need to, you know, uh, concentrate on what we already have. Maybe to bounce also this question off to you, Molen, what do you actually think about this proposition? Well, the idea, the whole idea of having a hospital is you're able to treat people. And uh, by treating people, it means that you should have medication. But oftentimes, we have seen that most of these government hospitals never really have treatment, never really have medicines. And for me, that's the key area they should be concentrating on. I don't know, because we do have pharmaceuticals here in the country that do manufacture some of the drugs that don't even appear in some of these government hospitals. So I don't know how they are purchasing medicine, because it doesn't make sense for you to go to a health center hospital and then they give you prescription sometimes even the doctors are few and you have to line up all day to wait for one doctor so when the doctor comes all they do is just examine you and they give you a prescription they're like you know what you have to now go to a clinic to buy the medicine or get treatment there so what use is it so i think there should be a lot of money diverted into making sure there is medicine in these hospitals before we revamp on adding more hospitals because it is still going to be the same story mm. and i have had a personal experience going to um, a hospital uh, i had a relative there and all of a sudden they didn't even have a cannula to actually put on this patient a big hospital and i'm like okay so this is how government hospitals actually operate it's just a shame and I think that that money should be diverted to making sure that these hospitals are well equipped and are able to treat people. 
Well, very, very sad that I really picked interest in what Robert over there said, to be everywhere and to be nowhere. It just reminded me of a famous saying by a famous historian where they did say, you have learned nothing and forgotten nothing indeed. It's more or less as good as useless. Well, <laughs> we are yet to find that out. But also, it's time for us to usher in on some of the stories that we did have trending on the news table. And that is, of course, from yesterday, both locally and internationally. I'll outside of the Ugandan borders into the East African borders onto the African borders and of course outside the African borders well we'll take you through some of them right about now yesterday was World Press Freedom Day and Joyce in Uganda joined the rest of the world to celebrate this day now Ugandan journalists celebrated the day which was on the theme journalism under digital siege although the theme highlights ways in which surveillance and digital mediated attacks endanger the journalism profession, the media seems failing to deliver its mandate. Journalists hold policy accountable to the public and are actually the eye and ears of the public, but the digital era has ushered in more players who escape the gatekeeping process. John Cliff Wamala, a journalist, is a victim of attacks. While on duty, he strives to push for press freedom. The constitution provides for freedom of press and expression. The Uganda Communications Commission and the Uganda Media Council also regulate media operations and as well mediate the process of advocating for proper working conditions and pay. Although they have suppressed the provisions of the supreme law of the land, the constitution says journalists have their rights and freedoms. Every 3rd of May is a reflection for the media professions on press freedom and ethics in Uganda. Yesterday it was also used to remember journalists who have lost their lives in the line of duty. Another story, the State Minister for Higher Education, Dr. John Muyingo, has warned vendors of government property donated to the newly commissioned seed secondary schools. This follows a known people who broke into the computer laboratory and stole eight computers belonging to Luwube Seed Secondary School in Katika Mulwere District. Recently, government commissioned seed secondary schools across the country and donated computers, textbooks to ensure a conducive environment of the learners. But strangers are stealing property belonging to the seed secondary schools. At Ruwe Secondary School in Wero District, eight computers were stolen after thieves broke in through the window. Now, the State Minister for Higher Education, Dr. John Muyingo, is worried that such behavior will affect the quality of education for learners. The minister was addressing over 20,000 ongoing learners and those completed under Bam Nanika Constituency Education Fund during a seminar at Bam Nanika Mulaje Technical Institute in Wero. On the issue of Bam Nanika Constituency Education Fund program, he promised it will continue and advise communities in Bam Nanika not to politicize this program. He advised parents as schools prepare for a second term to own the responsibility of their children. The deputy RDC Ruero Mariam Kaveruka commended the minister for improving education sector but hinted on the rampant land wrangles that the function attended among others the bishop of Ruero diocese. And now we look at an update on crime that occurred during the two public holidays, which was Idi Al-Fitli and Labor Day. Kampala Metropolitan Police arrested 57 suspects during the Idi Al-Fitri celebrations over cases of pickpocketing, robbery and domestic violence. The police have also reported 119 road accidents which claimed 23 lives in public in the two public holidays, that was Labor Day and Idi al -Fitri. Crime report for last week indicates that major accidents happened during the main public holidays. In Kampala Metropolitan, Idi al -Fitri, criminal minded people took advantage of people who are having Idi prayers, disguising at was as worshippers to steal shoes and other belongings at crowded mosques. At night during celebrations, Event organizers who failed to meet security requirements were also blocked and those who tried to misbehave police arrested 37 of them. During the celebrations, traffic police reinforced operations and 9,679 traffic offenders were arrested. The celebrations of Labor Day and Idi al brought 119 accidents where 62 people were fatally injured 
33 were minor accidents and this involved 111 victims claiming 23 lives and 88 people sustained serious injuries. Police have called upon fuel station owners to upscale the security overnight shift. This is due to increasing petrol station robberies and a week in review two petrol stations were attacked. In general, the police say it registered success in policing this although over 10 lives were claimed due to murder where people were attacked and also cases of domestic violence and homicides. And away from that, we look at Kampala air pollution. Now, government is at risk of spending on treatment of respiratory diseases in Kampala urban city settlers following the increase of levels in air pollution in the city. Now, a report from Air Quality Monitoring Network shows that Kampala City has for the last seven months experienced extremely high levels of air pollution above the expected levels by the World Health Organization. Now, this was during a press conference at the Uganda Media Center. Kampala City has for the last seven months registered the highest levels of air pollution above the expected levels as per the World Health Organization. A report by the Air Quality Monitoring Network shows that Kawempe Division has had the highest pollution concentration, followed by Busega, Kampala Civic Division, Chireka, Chira, among others. Now, the contributing pollutant sources in the report include vehicles in dangerous mechanical conditions, open solid waste um, burning and disposal, dusty roads, and high concentration of factories in the capital city. Now, as Uganda commemorates the World Quality Air Week, recommendations include adopting greenhouse technology, restriction of entry of DMC vehicles, and proper waste disposal. KCA Director Public Health Dr. Daniel Okello warns that if no action is taken, the surge in the air pollution related death will all outweigh the HIV AIDS cases. Similarly, there has been a rise in cases of respiratory diseases like asthma. Efforts to scale down pollution levels through continuous monitoring, tree planting, awareness creation are managed by different stakeholders. Now, air pollution causes heart disease, lung cancer, and respiratory diseases such as asthma, among others. Well, now crossing over to outside the African borders, abortion ruling. Now, the U.S. Supreme Court says a leak Israel as investigation launched. A leak document suggesting millions of U.S. women could lose their legal right to abortion is a genuine, the Supreme Court's Chief Justice has confirmed. But it does not represent the court's final decision, said John Roberts. The leak has stirred expectations that the 1973 decision, which legalized abortion in the U.S., could be overturned, allowing individual states to ban it. President Joe Biden has argued that the decision, if it goes ahead, could call other freedoms into question. The leaked document labeled first draft appears to reflect the majority opinion of the court. Written by Justice Samuel Alito, it calls the 1973 Roe v. Wade ruling, which legalized abortion across the U.S. egregiously wrong from the start. The draft is not a final ruling and opinions could change, but if Roe v. Wade is overturned, around half of U.S. states could ban abortion. In a statement, Chief Justice Roberts described the leak of the draft, first published by U.S. website Politico as a singular and egregious breach, and asked the march of the Supreme Court to launch an investigation. The work of the court would not be affected in any way, he added. The draft's release has caused a wave of reaction from both sides. And moving on to Ukraine, well, Ukrainian group Antilita have teamed up with Ed Sheeran, releasing a new song partly filmed and recorded while serving in the war against Russia. Now, Antilita are one of the biggest musical acts in Ukraine, but stopped working to join the military. Now, proceeds from the song released on Monday will go to help the people of Ukraine. Ed feels that pain, compassion and sympathy for Ukrainian people, lead singer Taras Topolia told the BBC. He said the lyrics were created while he was serving as a medic on the front line in Boryodyanka. Boryodyanka, just west of the capital Kiev, was occupied by the Russians who left the town badly damaged. Ukrainian troops have since regained the area. 
After writing the lyrics, members of the group were also able to film while on the front line in Kharkiv. We just stopped in the middle of the road and were singing there in the middle of nowhere, he said. Now, Antelita went viral earlier this year after they posted a video offering to perform via live link at a concert of Ukraine in Birmingham. Organizers of the concert, which featured Ed Sheeran, turned down the offer because of the group's association with the military. And crossing over to Nigeria, well, the United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres on a tour of West Africa is due in Northeast Nigeria to meet families who have been affected by the Islamist insurgency. He's traveling from neighboring Niger, another country that has been under sustained attacks from jihadist militants. Mr. Guterres is pushing for robust African peace initiatives as well as counter-terrorism operations under the auspices of the African Union. He will also be having talks with the Nigerian President, Muhammadu Buhari, on the impact on Africa food and energy price increases excavated by the conflict in Ukraine. This is the first visit of the UN Secretary General to Nigeria. The heat wave in India sparks blackouts and highlights dependency on coal. An unusual early and brutal heat wave is coaching parts of India with acute power shortages affecting millions as they demand for electricity surges to record levels. Suppliers of coal at many thermal power plants are running uh, low, sporing daily power outrages in several states. Now, the shortages are sparking scrutiny in India's long-term reliance on coal, which produces 70% of the country's electricity. The situation highlights India's pressing need to diversify its energy sources as demand for electricity is expected to increase more than anywhere else in the world over the next 20 years as the densely populated countries uh, develop, according to the International Energy Agency. The shortages hit as blisteringly high temperatures are sweeping over parts of the country, prompting authorities to close schools, sparkling fires at gigantic landfills, and also crops as well as cool spring turned into unrelating heat. India recorded its hottest March since 1901, and an average temperatures in April in the northern and central pockets of the country were the highest in 122 years as the Indian Meteorological Department said. Now temperatures breached 45 degrees Celsius in the 10 cities last week although cloudy skies and rain could bring some relief soon. Well, in our conversation this morning, we want to find out from you some of your thoughts on government's diversion of funds to already existing hospitals instead of building new ones. Now, like we did talk about it earlier on, it was a proposition that was put across by some members of parliament, you know, to have this money diverted to be able to, you know, work on the already existing hospitals, which are not exactly in the best of conditions as opposed to building up new hospitals. Well, do share with us some of your thoughts and definitely it's the same drill. Get to our Twitter, the hashtag is UBCGMU. You may as well go traditional, send us an SMS text. Better yet, you can send us a WhatsApp message on the number 0709-602-592. We'll be getting into it as Good Morning Uganda goes on. But also, here on Good Morning Uganda, we know that your health is very important and we prioritize in making sure we give you all the information that you need to make sure that uh, you match up to it 100%. And this right here is where Robert comes in. So one of the ways of being patriotic is when you support what has been made in your country. Now here is hallelujah, jinga tea, hallelujah, tamari drink. These drinks boost your immune system and of course you reduce on your health bill but also the inconvenience that comes with not feeling fine. Buy Uganda, build Uganda. Oh, well, I really love the energy that uh, you really picked from the shaking the bottles. I don't know whether that is what we should be expecting 
if we are on a drill of or if we are on a dosage of uh, that hallelujah but i want to believe so a hundred percent well we here in good morning uganda will believe that you work better with some inspiration and of course this is the minute this is the moment when we bring in some inspirational songs from very wonderful and amazing women to see uh, to make sure you that we see you through wednesday like i told you it's midweek happiness for us yes we want to extend the happiness to you and definitely we want to make sure we project it on you as well we go in for the inspiration song when we get back it will be good morning uganda newsreel and of course much later on do expect some traffic updates and again from the climate arena the weather prophetess will definitely be here to fill you in 100 percent and of course gmu agenda is also in the queue not forgetting the sports updates that will be coming in live to you any minute from now we are streaming live on youtube so make sure you catch up with us to see what we are all about we'll be back shortly good morning live live from ubc studios in kampala this is good morning uganda Live from UBC Studios in Kampala. This is Good Morning Uganda. Live from UBC Studios in Kampala. This is Good Morning Uganda. Live from UBC Studios in Kampala. This is Good Morning Uganda. Live from UBC Studios in Kampala. This is Good Morning Uganda. Live from UBC Studios in Kampala. This is Good Morning Uganda. Live from UBC Studios in Kampala. This is Good Morning Uganda. Live from UBC Studios in Kampala. This is Good Morning Uganda. Live from UBC Studios in Kampala. This is Good Morning Uganda. Live from UBC Studios in Kampala. This is Good Morning Uganda. Live from UBC Studios in Kampala. This is Good Morning Uganda. Live from UBC Studios in Kampala. This is Good Morning Uganda. Live from UBC Studios in Kampala. This is Good Morning Uganda. Live from UBC Studios in Kampala. This is Good Morning Uganda. Live from UBC Studios in Kampala. This is Good Morning Uganda. Live 
live from UBC Studios in Kampala. This is Good Morning Uganda. Live from UBC Studios in Kampala. This is Good Morning Uganda. Live from UBC Studios in Kampala. This is Good Morning Uganda. Live from UBC Studios in Kampala. This is Good Morning Uganda. Just use MTN to make calls, send SMS, load airtime, buy bundles, or pay for MTN subscription services. Everywhere you go, MTN. Total Energies has undertaken a number of initiatives aimed at ensuring that Ugandan entities and citizens are adequately equipped to participate in the oil and gas sector. Yeah, we do manufacture and supply personal protective equipment. Uh, we supply beyond Total Energies. We supply their subcontractors. Yeah, we have seen our company transform from uh, a trading company to a manufacturing entity. We are able to set up some, some of these facilities that we are enjoying right now. And these facilities also are supporting other sub-sectors. So they have no idea what oil and gas is, but the items they are using are a result of oil and gas. Overall, the industry, manufacturers, suppliers, traders will all enjoy it. Total Energy's EP Uganda is committed to the empowerment of Ugandans to take an active part in the overall development of the oil project in Uganda. Live from UBC Studios in Kampala. This is Good Morning Uganda. Good morning, Uganda, once again. Well, thank you for joining us for this segment on the newsreel. My name is Philomena Masko. We are lucky to have been blessed by the morning showers. Well, I hope it can go well for you. If you're planning to make your way to town, well, you need to prepare accordingly so that you're not sabotaged by these rains. And indeed, we gave you the inspiration from one of those phenomenal, you know, uh, phenomenal women, Alicia Kiz, if I ain't got you. We hope that can be inspiration enough for you this morning. Well, before we get into the conversation, me and Robert travel over here, uh, just to remind you of our poll question that is running. Share your thoughts on government's diversion of funds on two already existing hospitals as opposed to building new ones. Definitely we'll be wanting to hear from you to share your two cents with us as we also share the same thoughts and opinions with the rest of the world. But this morning, me and Robert want to tackle an issue that we have seen happen over the years and it's still happening even when we know we have local authorities in place to make sure they contra it and that is a topic of mob justice now yesterday there was a story about uh, a man in Mbale district who was suspected of rape. Now, before he was handed over to police, he was actually beaten up and, uh, you know, the people decided to take the justice in their hands to be able to effect it to him. And he was left in a very wanting state. And we saw him actually having to go to hospital to get treatment first before anything was decided to be put on the table. But again, this is not the case. Over the time, we've seen cases happen. Some come on record, others off record. Now, just 
just to take you back to some of the statistics, back in 2020, we had 540 cases. And in 2019, we had 740 cases. Of course, some local authorities, Robert, come to say that uh, this decrease was because we actually had a, a very serious lockdown. And we know that even the crime rate between these two years went down. But again, the argument was that after we are fully open, this is going to come up again. And clearly, we are seeing that some cases are starting to come up and this we condemn of course here as good morning uganda and as ubc tv but also we know that this is unlawful but maybe before we get into it robert could you take us through what mob justice exactly is uh well locally <coughs> we call it court in bagirao mm. that where well, they suspect you uh, they listen then they sentence you to whatever Happens. Do they even listen? <laughs> because what <laughs> happens is uh, some want to call it the public court, which I don't believe. But mob justice is a form of extra judicial punishment. Yes. Where someone does not go through the formal uh, judicial procedure or process to have that person either proven guilty or indications exonerating him of that crime that is found innocent because that is what courts of law do. What happens, a crime is committed or an offense is committed, someone is suspected. Then the mob pounces on him, or even sometimes authorities. There are places where the chairman just directs that Philomena, you've been found so, mm, 100 strokes of the cane. That's yes. also a form of mob justice. Mm. Yeah? Because what you're doing, that is not what the law well, that the law requires. So the village committee will, will scatter people there, then mm, this one is scanning. All those, as long as it, you know, because our laws, because we have a constitution, when a crime is committed, there's a proper process we follow. Contrary to that, where we see mobs, groups pounce on someone, then this is what we are talking about. Sometimes death to the worst happens. Some people sustain permanent uh, body damages. Some are burnt with jerry cans, with all sorts of things that inflict pain <coughs> yes. on their lives. So brief, that's what I can call mob justice. Well, now, we already know that this is uh, very unlawful because they're not going through the court orders or they're not going through the systematic way of handling a criminal or even a suspected criminal. But also, Robert, in all these areas where we say we have local authorities in place, so somebody would actually ask, why is this still happening? Even when we have all these local authorities, where I stay, Robert, I don't know how many police stations I am surrounded with, but I mean, it would be very sad if we had an incident like this happen. And again, this is not just only in my place, even all other areas where we're seeing these cases. So why is it still happening? All these statistics, why are they still prevailing? Why do we still have people carrying out mob justice, taking the authority upon themselves to put people to book and, uh, you know, effect the justice on the suspected criminals or even the criminals, let's just say, it has been confirmed that they committed what they did commit. Actually, I was even looking through a report by Afrobarometer, one of the research institutions, and it said in the last seven weeks, we've lost 42 people to mob justice. You're suspected? Yeah, hey, you, you, you run, you're caught. By the time police arrives, you're gone. Yes. Now, first is lack of trust in the formal justice system that people believe that justice is not going to be served. If you've stolen my, uh, because mostly in rural areas, you know those people, they steal their goats, they steal their cows, before we come to town. Yes. What right, is burglary, <coughs> someone uh, snatches a phone. <coughs> you find that this person has reared his goat for the last one year. Mm. Maybe hoping to sell it around December. Or looking at it that this will solve my problem. Now, some youth come in some car, they steal these goats, slaughter them, take meat. By God's grace, these villagers, someone tips them off that there is a car we suspect. So what they do, they either use their techniques, put bulkheads, whatever, they nab these people. Oh, the first thing that comes to their mind, if we take them to police, they will be released, then they will come back, and commit the same offense. Mm. So it's better we send them to the creator, not Ourselves. sending them. Yes. Because there we know if they have been 30 mm. stealing our goats, at least we've reduced four of them. There could be others. Mm. 
But we've reduced four of them, we've created fear, and they were also, uh, for some time, fear to do this. So they sent them to the creator, rather than sending them to police and the judicial process to commence. Mm. Because they don't trust that process. Because they have seen some that one time stole, they were handed over to police, now in another offense or incident, they are the same people arrested. And to a villager, it's hard to explain that to them. Mm. That you know what happens, a person gets bond, uh, what happens, a person gets bail in court, what happens, and then for an ordinary villager, you don't explain that to them. Yes. That now you see what happens after some time, now a person has been on remand, and you did not come to testify or be witnesses, so this person is released. For them, they want to know that Robert Chirabo was driving this car. <coughs> it was gotten by police. He's now serving 10, 20 years. Yet sometimes our judicial system has got its weaknesses. We must accept. Our police has got its weaknesses. So what happens? Because they don't trust that system, they resort to mob justice. Mm. Second is the fact that some are ignorant you know, trusting and not knowing are two different things. Absolutely. So others are ignorant of how that system works. I said one is lack of trust, but now two is they are ignorant. That fellow, today in Uganda, a person will arrest you and take you to police. Police, over any offense. Mm. Then they'll go back and brag, or you Then after 48 hours, you're released. It doesn't mean that the offense has been dealt with completely mm. or the file has been closed. But you've been released. There are sureties as investigations continue to get you. So this person, you cannot convince them. What our day you sent? Yes. Say, ah, police, you take a person in two days, they are there. You take a person, they are back to the communities. So you rather finish that person in a layman who has not had the knowledge of the law. That taking me to police, yes, you can take me to police. But if, my, if I'm seen that I'll be produced, the law gives them 48 hours. They will release me. That's why of late now police has changed that they do their things. Yes. That they will first call the complainer <coughs> and explain that this person you brought here, we are going to give him police bond. Mm. Because the 48 hours have elapsed. We are not yet done with investigations to produce him to court. So we are going to release him on a bond, but then we are going to continue following up. When the file is taken, he will come, he will go to court, and the process will commence. Others don't know that even in court, there is bail. But it is a right, yes. it's a constitutional right mm. for someone. So out of ignorance, they resort to mob justice because definitely they think it's the only way of eliminating this criminal character. And when they find this coupled with the law staffing, the justice that, does is not, that is delayed in our country, at the end of the day, that brings a problem. Finally, why people resort to this is corruption. Hmm. In this country, Access to justice day by day is becoming expensive and for selected few people. It's something sh that should have been ideally free because Very you're entitled free. to, you know, get and justice. And then the problem of corruption comes in that a thief will be arrested, goes to police, fellow thieves or whatever, they'll come, pay. You know, about 48 hours. I personally have ever witnessed this for code of affairs. Mm. Not them that con people of good money. Yes. This person had conned about 32 million. It was very hard arresting him, nabbing him. He was eventually arrested. As we were at the police station, another good mufere came driving a Range Rover Sport Blue, <laughs> named some name, customized number plate. Mm. When he came in, he went to the office of the DPC. By then, Kajan's police station. So when he entered there, they talked and talked. In a few minutes, he came and told us, do you know what evidence you have? He said, give me my brother. The two police officers 
that had helped me arrest this Mufiri were detained because they had arrested someone uh, here in an area of not that jurisdiction and they had not first informed the area police. Yes. Yet we were told if you inform the area police, <coughs> they will call this man and he will run away. Man exchanged hands. We were left looking. So I had now to see how I get my police officers. Of course, they were let out after some investigations. So when such incidents happen, and it is clear it has been money, it has been corruption, our police still has wrong elements of corruption. That is, that enjoy, feed, and feast on corruption. So those three factors are making a fertile ground for mob justice to prevail in this country. Well, you did actually make mention of how, you know, in corruption that you've just talked about, but you also talked about how people have lost um, trust in the judicial system, which actually brings me to the next uh, question where, you know, we have to talk about the integrity of the judicial system in Uganda, and it's significant to the rule, uh, to the rule of law in Uganda. I mean, all this we are seeing that it zeroes down to the you know, criminal justice. I am going to put this person there and uh, because you have probably, I suspect you stole something of mine and even 40 hour, 48 hours don't elapse, 36 hours or even just in a span of a couple of hours, this person is already out. Now, Robert, in your opinion, what should be able, uh, what should be done to make sure that we restore the trust that people have or that people should ideally be having in the justice system? Because if we don't restore this peace, Robert, I can tell you, the statistics are going to go higher and higher because what's the essence of me uh, grabbing this person and uh, taking them to prison or taking handing them over to police and I know this person is going to get back onto the streets and still do the same thing probably in a worse situation so what can be done to make sure that we restore the trust uh, by the public or by the law-abiding citizens in the criminal justice system in Uganda you know a friend of mine told me that now police no, no longer calls Suspects. Suspects. <laughs> now they call them clients. Oh, okay. <laughs> Very interesting. Every time you take a suspect to police, they see a client. You're taking suspect? a client who is coming with the money. Because mm. they believe he's not going to live free. Yes. Police bond, the posters are there, mm -hmm. is free. But in few police stations, our viewers watching us, <laughs> where police bond is free. Mm hmm. So every time you arrest, you're, you're submitting a client? You're taking a client. <laughs> so when we have such a situation of a suspect being a client, there is no way you may reduce this. I condemn mob justice in the strongest terms, and I want to be put on record on that, because innocent lives have perished in this mob justice. Because sometimes it could be even mistaken identity. Yes. Because we have seen a yes. couple of innocent people lose their, lose lives, their lives. And the truth comes out much later much on later. when you can't reverse the yeah. situation. So I condemn mob justice. Of course, there are some incidents where you're like, ha, tuli <laughs> hey, Like I told you that Mufere good COVID-19 <laughs> took bash with it. Yes. Because he was untouchable. We knew his brother called hidden. They were untouchables. Mm. But COVID took the brother. May his soul rest where it has to be in one way or the other. But you asked me what can be done in the judicial system. One, we must improve staffing. Yes. When we talk about the judiciary, they have their weaknesses, I must accept. Mm -hmm. But still, there are very few on the ground. There are very few. A judge may have about 1,000 filers perusing through and all this. That's why you see that a case in Uganda, there are cases that have lasted 10 years. You know? Final judgment has not been given. There are cases where we see even witnesses, you know, they go, they study, there was a case of desire. Is it desire Mirembe? The young lady who was killed by, by allegedly the, the yes. boyfriend and all that. But when you hear the circus <coughs> in this case, until the family came up in the media, even how long it took Even actually how long for it the justice took. to be served. Someone who was doing a degree now he's finished a master's, is going for a PhD, all this nonsense. But one thing there is understaffing. Yes. We need to improve the staffing of the judiciary. Two, our investigators. 
Sometimes I always tell people that let's also be realistic. Someone has committed murder. He's a loaded person. Mm. You bring a person <laughs> right from where they sleep, what they earn, they have families. Yes, we talk about patriotism. We talk about ethical code of conduct. We talk about integrity. But this someone can be rendered vulnerable and easy to compromise. These gallant sons and daughters of this country, we must look into their welfare as well. If we expect so much from them, I believe mean, we are expecting so much from a cow, we are not feeding. Oh, we are feeding, but if it gets breakfast, maybe elephant grass, it waits for other two days. Mm. This young man you're telling to go and investigate, a man who stole a car, a man who broke in with a gun or something like that, my friend, even transport is an issue. He has left, uh, even where he has stayed there for three share. You know, recently I saw the parliamentary committee visiting some of these places where they stay in Bali, where. Mm. I was like, how do you expect such a man in such a situation to sit, Philo, and hold a file, eh? read through, concentrate, then determine proper investigation? As is there, a tactful Chidabu says, but I found, I think we can talk. Hmm. The man is compromised 100% from head to toe. We need to improve that element. Then second, we need to have institutions that monitor and hold accountable certain people in the judicial procedure of this country. Uganda police has what they call the professional standards unit. It is in Ibukoto. Mm. That thing was last relevant to Ugandans when it was headed by a man, I think, was it called John Ndunguse or Ndunguse, something like that? Yes. And it had been established a few years. You would see police officers real held accountable, regardless of rank and file. No, because these peeps and these, eh, mean a lot. You're not going to hold accountable someone when you have an empty <laughs> call and you're going. So, yes. so that <coughs> was very effective. You report a case, it is investigated. I think it was even better facilitated, I don't know. It is investigated, that officer will be brought to book. But Robert, how would we be sure that even those institutions, eventually, mm -hmm. corruption won't infiltrate through? Because we've seen higher institutions mm -hmm. that are supposed to be holding these other institutions accountable. Mm -hmm. Well, doing more or less the same. Mm, but at least if they are active, mm. like I told the PSU yes. and Andunguse was very, very active. Today, go to PSU and report a case. You rather go to courts of law <laughs> because it will even <laughs> take longer. It will mean nothing. I don't know whoever is heading it. Police <laughs> needs assistance, and government should look at this as a priority yes. to clean the force. The police disciplinary court is also funny. Mm? Sometimes some, we see it on more on political issues and all that. So that becomes a problem. So if these institutions don't have checks and balances yes. that will keep them on data hooks really to know that there's someone watching, you know, then they are going to do things their way. Let's improve on their welfare. Let's improve on their staffing. Yes. You know, let's improve on what they need to work. And let's have this uh, biting dog that is watching and monitoring their activities. Well, just to remind you of our poll question this morning, we are asking you to share your thoughts on government's diversion of funds to already existing hospitals instead of building new ones. Hashtag UBCGMU and you can send us an SMS text or even a WhatsApp message on 0709-602592. Now, as we're trying to wrap this one up, Robert, mm -hmm. um, of course, there are arguments that come through to say that uh, aside from the criminal justice system uh, being in a, such a derailed model or format, but also it goes down to the morals of the people. They have derailed and uh, of course seeing that local authorities as well are being incompetent. Now this is uh, for the main uh, criminal justice system, but when we get down to the local authorities, our very own police people who should be on ground, should we say they are very incompetent? And if they are, because by the time you come through and you find that uh, the deed has already been done, okay, they have already beaten this person, you're lucky to find them alive. You're probably uh, unlucky if they're already gone. 
but do we say that they're incompetent? They, do they have something that is going on that we are not seeing? And anyway, what can we do to make sure that uh, they're very effective? Because we expect you, if I call you as police, I expect you to be there in, in quite a, an, an amount of time to make sure the situation is, uh, it doesn't go further than it should. On the contrary, Philo, our police is very interesting. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> These guys are very interesting. I want to tell you, you can call and ring those numbers, telling them thieves have attacked us, and they'll take a long time to come. Or they will probably ask tell for them. fuel. <laughs> <laughs> the mob has arrested a thief, and they are, <laughs> and they are about to lynch him. In about five minutes, the police patrol will be there, and they will even fire to disperse yes. the crowd and yes. save a client. <laughs> so, there I don't know, because <laughs> in terms of police responding yes. uh, to save mob justice, I must say you're very effective, Uganda police. Mm. Very effective. Even if it is a hoax, I tell them that around there there is a mob. I want to tell you they will come and save that person. Very so they, responsible. They are very responsible. Yes. So I must commend them on that. Now, to the moral fabric, I want to tell Ugandans that please and please, mob justice does not solve a problem. Our judicial service, our judicial process could have problems. But one thing, you can reach an innocent person. That is one. Two, if all was as ought to be, when a person is arrested, investigations carry, are carried on. They discover more beyond what you would establish by just lynching this person. So let's always give benefit of doubt to our institutions. Hand over these people to police. That's when you find that they'll tell you they have broken a cell. They have uh, been able to arrest. Uh, most times you see in the papers, gang leader. Gang leader. Yes. That's how they get to them because they'll take this person, they'll interrogate them, they'll get more information. But for you, kill one thief, yet they are 100. And what will happen? Or you kill an innocent person, and this innocent blood is on you, your children, and generations to come. Absolutely. When you do that, whether you are part of it uh, actively or passively, uh, clearly it is still part of you. The moment you see a situation like that, you can always be the responsible one. Uh, because when we do this, when we engage ourselves in uh, mob justice, we are denying the other party the, la uh, you know, the opportunity for innocence or to, for themselves to defend against uh, all this that is happening and give you the clear story. So. Do not be involved in mob justice in any way, passively or actively. We absolutely don't agree with that, and we condone it as Good Morning Uganda and as UBC TV. Well, that's it for the newsreel this morning. We'll be getting into the press, into the papers, to see what's making the headlines. The New Vision, the Daily Monitor, and the Daily Nation. Much later on, I'll be taking you to the roads to see what's happening on this Wednesday morning. We'll be back shortly after this break. Good Even with my grandson, a doctor at my side, I struggled to get the help I needed. But he saw something that day. He began to work day and night. He wouldn't quit, even when people said no. He wouldn't stop fighting. He knew something had to change. And his vision was bigger than anyone could imagine. He made it possible to receive quality medical services anywhere in Uganda by simply using a phone. This is a story of a regular Ugandan just like you, who harnessed the power of technology to provide a solution for us. How about you tell us your story? UG needs more of you. To share your story, visit airtel.co.ug slash UG needs more of you or call or SMS 162.
Airtel, the smartphone network. When you talk about our motherland Uganda, the Pearl of Africa, you cannot fail to smile because of the smile that fills the faces of the citizens. Our nice good weather and nature that sustains us all, that enables us all to continue each in their own way because we are all different even according to each individual's work. But what joins us to become one person is the sweetness from the flavored drink Alleluia Jinga Tea Drink and Alleluia Tamarind Drink. The flavor that quenches your thirst while at the same time treating and healing your body because it is 100% natural. Enjoy the drink that has got the tamarind juice in it. Made by Alleluia Reflexology, Healthy Solutions and Nutritional Research Center Limited. Get yourself a bottle of Alleluia from all shops around. It's no secret that ICT makes learning easy. The strides made in our field couldn't be possible without it. And now we can watch our favorite show. Ah, my radio is my best friend. UCC provides an enabling regulatory environment and policy guidance for healthy competition. We also facilitate ease of doing business in the communications sector through licensing, standardization, spectrum management, tariff regulation, rural communication development and consumer empowerment. An informed consumer is an empowered consumer. UCC supports local content and innovations. Driving the development of a robust communication sector in Uganda is Uganda Communications Commission. Total Energies has undertaken a number of initiatives aimed at ensuring that Ugandan entities and citizens are adequately equipped to participate in the oil and gas sector. Yeah, we do manufacture and supply personal protective equipment. Uh, we supply beyond Total Energies. We supply their subcontractors. Yeah, we have seen our company transform from uh, a trading company to a manufacturing entity. We are able to set up some, some of these facilities that we are enjoying right now. And these facilities also are supporting other sub-sectors. So they have no idea what oil and gas is, but the items they are using are a result of oil and gas. Overall, the industry, manufacturers, suppliers, traders, we all enjoy Total Energy's EP Uganda is committed to the empowerment of Ugandans to take an active part in the overall development of the oil project in Uganda. This is Good Morning Uganda. Well, in the press review this morning, uh, taking a look at what made the stories in the papers and starting off with the Daily Monitor this morning, the big story over there being air pollution in Kampala gets worse. And uh, this was according to a report that was released yesterday by Air Q4. And of course, the details are in this report. And of course, they have been put down in the Monitor paper. More reason for you to get this paper and to and tell yourself with all the details. And the full story is over there on page six. But also a milestone for um, Barara Regional National Referral Hospital. Um, well, we do have uh, Ugandan doctors are separating conjoined uh, twins. And uh, well, this is very, very, very interesting and uh, quite amazing and good work. Showing you the pictures of before the twins were, you know, separated and after they were separated. Get the full story this morning in the Daily Monitor. And in more news, torture, poor pay, dominate world press freedom day which was yesterday and of course uh, all these details come out and mps block government plan to impose fees without approval 
So Ugandan women jump to death abroad, quite such a sad story over there. And there is a pullout for excellent PLE for your students and for your children. And then instilling more homes, what to consider before investing in rental property. <coughs> Moving on to the second page of the Daily Monitor. This morning, Uganda drops seven places in press freedom ranking at the continuation of the big story. And members of parliament cite gaps in 72 billion shillings request for PDM rollouts. Well, taking you back in time, today in history, King's African rifles fight cattle raids. And uh, of course, still in more history, Thatcher becomes British premier well when how all those details that is why you need to get yourself a copy of this paper to catch up on all the stories but also in the new vision this morning well in the new vision uh, we look at uh, the tax holiday for the jagari project also rejected that's the reason page seven of the new vision for this morning we look at mps blocking that tax on land sale well, the new vision gives you a whole picture of the UPDF seizing weapons from Al Shabaab as, uh, you know, General Brigadier General Keith Katunji is handing over some of the weapons to Al Shabaab um, from Al Shabaab to the Deputy Head of African Mission right there. Interesting picture. Now, also in the new vision for this morning, how the Kanzu became a dress of honor. Well, there is more to that story. And it is on page 24 of the New Vision for this morning. 24,000 learners get classrooms. The Education Ministry will commission 60, 69 new seed schools throughout the country. Well, while we also saw a story of people trying to steal from these seed schools, Uganda. Well, but also in the New Vision, they show you top child trafficking districts are revealed in the new report, which districts have been ranking high in that. Look at page five of the New Vision for this morning. Labor export to Ugandans in Saudi Arabia, Shan Hospitals. That is also on page four of the New Vision for this morning. But also on page two of the New Vision, they show you the Igara West MP, Louis uh, Mbatekamwe who was celebrating his 44th birthday in style by assisting traffic officers on uh, the Spear Road in Nakawa, Kampala. Wow, that is interesting. Very good picture of him right there. Uh, get yourself a copy of the new vision. But also today in history, on May 4th, 2001, Museveni backs Mbarara RDC for municipality seat. Well, that's an interesting one right there. But also in uh, 1979, Tacha elected premier that is, Margaret Thatcher becomes the British first female Prime Minister after a conservation won a 44-seat majority in the general parliamentary elections. That is also right there in the new vision for today. Well, moving into the daily monitor sports, starting off with the allure of the PAL. Uh, Blake wants to win PAL rally for Sun, Alistair. And of course, uh, if you're a fan of the rally drivings, well, definitely this is a story for you not to miss out. And uh, taking a look at the NBA playoffs, the big man over there, Dandre Ayton, scored 25 points as the Phoenix Suns took an early 1 to nil advantage in the Western Conference semifinals after beating the Dallas Mavericks 121 to 114. Or 114 and bright stars flop chance as vipers stretch winning run in top flight and to the second page well there's quite a full page full of uh, pictorial obua full of praise for netball the ladies shining at the awards where we had the best in the business of course the sky is the limit over there and well it was actually a very a wonderful uh, event for the uganda netball federation well, make sure you catch up on all the details at what happened at, what happened at these first awards gala. And uh, still Uganda Golf Club quarterly mag of mags reinvented all that in the Daily Monitor Sports this Wednesday morning. Well, in the New Vision Sport, they show you uh, Laurie Gomez of Zambia racing during a previous Larry, and that is... Uh, also regarding the ongoing uh, championship with the Shell V Power Pal of Africa, Larry. They also give you a picture of Yasin Nasa, who is pushing for the ARC title. 
well, looks like there is a lot to look out for, but there is more stories on that championship that is the Shell V Power Pal of Africa Larry in the Norwegian sport for today. Is Villa safe? Now, Sports Club Villa have three games to save what has been one of the most disappointing campaigns ever in their history. Now, that is on top of getting knocked out of the Stanvik Bank, uh, the Stanvik Uganda Cup. Now they have to struggle to see if they are on top fight for the next season. There is more also in the New Vision Sport for this morning. Moving on to the Daily Nation, decision 2022 still prevailing. And the next DP, well, question over there, who will be the next DP? Of course, two weeks of jostling and lobbying and uh, quite a number of uh, people uh, there. Decision time, of course, one of these men and women could actually be Kenya's deputy president in less than 100 days. And still in more news, Sankoksan killed in gun incident had refused to go back to school. Hmm. And still in more news, caught first off after police bosses ignore order to rein state pay. And uh, getting into the world of fashion, stars sparkle at the Met Gala, which happened on Monday. And uh, there is still more tips for you from motoring and, uh, of course, parenting. So make sure you grab yourself uh, the Daily Nation this morning to just uh, get onto some of these stories about what's happening over there in Kenya. But also what's happening here on Ugandan roads is a really, really crazy. And I don't know why, but it's a Wednesday you'd actually expect some relaxation on the roads, but that is not the situation. Now, before I give you the traffic updates, just to remind you of our poll question that is running on our social media, on our Twitter, and definitely want you to share your thoughts on government's diversion of funds to already existing hospitals instead of building new ones. UBCGMU and the numbers are over there on your screen so you can already send in your feedback. We'll be getting into it shortly after this. But this morning, if you are a resident of Seta, if you're a resident of Chireka, Boyo Gerede and Nakawa, you know, as you come closer to town, I am in your area code this morning and I want to let you know that uh, from Seta, it's actually a very freeway as you approach uh, Boyogere, the green lines are very evident of that. However, you need to expect some traffic hiccups over here, uh, as shown by the red spots here. The traffic is intense on these areas or on these spots, and also the traffic is building up again around those areas. Now, these hiccups are to be expected as you go on all the way. However, as you're approaching Boyogere, the traffic intensifies, and the orange lines show that it's very, very evident. Of course, as you're approaching towards the junction over here we have cars coming in from Chirika. we have cars coming in from Chuanga up here so the junction is definitely expected to have a, a lot of traffic however when you manage to navigate around it it should be a freeway for you as you access Chirika by as uh, portrayed by this Chirika however is totally um, a bit manageable you can also navigate of course a few traffic um, hiccups here, traffic build-ups here because it's a junction and uh, seeing as it is a town, yes, it is expected to have uh, quite some traffic hiccups here and uh, build-ups over there. When you get through all that, expect some heavy traffic over here in Banda. Now, the red stretch is actually very, very evident showing here on the Kampala Jinja Highway. The red line here shows the stretch is actually very long, so you need to plan accordingly. If you're coming in from Banda, you could decide to use a different road as you are accessing Nakawa. Nakawa is not any different from Banda because the traffic is very intense as uh, shown here and uh, you should plan accordingly and also seeing that we have very many cars coming in from other areas now over here again like i said cars coming in from tinder road still connect via this junction cars coming in from um, chinawataka which is an alternative route definitely all converge here to make sure that they join the main road so plan again accordingly as you're heading to town but from what i'm seeing from the course of the roads as you get closer to town the traffic intensifies more so that should be a call out or it should be a red flag for you to start thinking of alternatives and other options as you're trying to access the city center of course when you get to the city center well i don't really have to say it it's not all rosy because the traffic is very intense 
distance the red lines here and there as you go ahead on this Jinja Kampala Highway. Of course, trying to access Kampala Road, well, you need to plan accordingly because the traffic is not really looking so nice this morning, especially if you're using that road or if you're coming from that part of Kampala. Well, that's it for the traffic updates, but also getting into the climate and the weather focus this morning. Molen, we have seen reports that have been coming in and they've been all over the place and I'm actually very, very worried that we are probably doing nothing. We have seen the pollution report where they say Kampala in the last seven months has been going crazy. The pollution is very high and if you're not careful, government may start spending money to treat respiratory diseases among the Ugandans. And this clearly, I know it's your area of interest and I'm pretty sure you're very mad about this like I am and very disappointed. <laughs> what is the way forward? What's happening? What's not happening? Well, it's upsetting that we have to wait for such a report to come out for us to realize that uh, there are challenges, especially with air pollution in, in Kampala. And uh, I, I would I'll say it's true that we could be spending, government could be looking at more expenditure on, on the health sector in regard to you know, respiratory diseases if this continues. Because uh, with seven months, if you look at even what is uh, being considered right now, seven months of air pollution over a city like Kampala, where you have uh, quite a large population, Population, then that means that people are being exposed to most of these, uh, you know, dust particles in the atmosphere, and this could be posing a huge health challenge that than we we're even looking at at this point, because we know that uh, one of the major contributors of this is obviously uh, the the factories around the city, and uh, I do know that with the plan of the city, some of these factories are supposed to be far away from the capital, but for some reason we have those in Kampala, <laughs> and, and 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 it's. It's just upsetting, I can tell you that. And of course, the dusty roads, the poor waste management, it's a lot going on around Kampala. And uh, I hope KCCA takes on this seriously because we could be looking at a huge health crisis. Well, I could say we as the residents of Kampala, we as Ugandans, we are also not doing a lot to make sure we save ourselves from problems like this. Again, like I always chant, it is a personal responsibility. We don't have to leave it to the government. We don't have to leave it to companies, but even you as an individual. Well, I hope this is solved if it's not too late already so that we are saved from all the monstrosities and the atrocities that are probably awaiting us right now or even in the long run. Well, that's it from the traffic update this morning i hand you officially now to Molen to give you more from the climate news and of course give you the weather forecast for later on today well have a great and wonderful wednesday morning i am philomena masco well i'll take it from there and uh you know i want to note that the interesting part with the report is that once they are made and given out it looks like people take it as just a document but this is the reality for as long as you don't have a direct effect or impact that you're looking at then it seems to be something like is far away or maybe even what is having us from uh, i would imagine seven months of such levels of air pollution would be causing even catastrophe now but i think we've also had the advantage that we have adapted to wearing masks that has helped a lot not just with protecting us from covid19 but also from the airborne uh, uh, you know diseases and that is helping so that means that uh, you know you might need to Keep that mask on even when uh, there is relaxation in wearing of masks like uh, the Ministry of Health has tried to advise because you still have air pollution in, in, in looming around so that means that you might need to keep that mask on otherwise there is a lot at stake and I think this has also got to do with laxity in some of the authorities that are supposed to be responsible to make sure that uh, we don't have such issues in the city so for example why are we still having a lot of factories or manufacturing factories in in Kampala and we have talked about the issue of having old uh, vehicles being imported into the country yes people will argue that you know these are cheap these are manageable new vehicles are expensive but the effect of having those old vehicles here is being evident now and when you're looking at reports like that and i think we should be transitioning to make sure that most of those are phased out uh, this is what every everyone is moving towards not just the developed countries but also developing countries so this is something that we can manage would rather embrace it and have you know the new vehicles other than having dangerous ones that are even posing risks to our health but also let's look at what is making headlines on the international scene. We do know that there is a follow-up on the story in the fires in New Mexico. We have seen more evacuations being done. Now this has triggered, triggered more uh, of the U.S. state authorities coming up to say there is need 
Now, the governor for the southwest part of uh, New Mexico did call upon President Joe Biden to actually take a look into more of the help necessary for people in New Mexico to have a living. Now that even one of the cities, a historic city, Las Vegas, has been threatened by these wildfires. Now, the fires are spreading, and this has been after a long, after a long period of drought crisis over the area. What we do know is that now there are more evacuations being done and more of the residents moving away from their homes uh, following these reports from the wildfires. Now, two wildfires that combined in New Mexico have prompted uh, evacuations of thousands of people. And much of the state is expected to be under critical fire threat even uh, since Tuesday into Wednesday. Now, this fire has been dubbed the Calf Canyon fire, which started on 19th of April and has now joined the Hamid's Peak Fire, which started on April 60th. That means the combination of this blaze has burnt more than 145,000 acres that was by yesterday and is just 20 percent contained so meaning that this fire is still on rampant uh, extents and could still be posing a lot of fire danger well parts of the state were also already under fire critical fire threat on monday but that is also expected to cover nearly all of uh, new mexico as per the meteorologist on ground reporting uh, this over the area now of course with the fires come with uh, a lot of reduction in visibility as there's huge smoke in the atmosphere and obviously that also poses a lot of challenge with living in the area so we are only getting reports that only the firefighters are on ground and most of the people are being evacuated from new mexico as they look at uh, one of uh, the most threatening uh, fire dangers they have had in a long time. But also that has been related mostly to the drought crisis that has been over there. Uh, looking into this year being, uh, you know, to a record level where there has been such an extent of drought over New Mexico. Now, in other news, we also want to look at a report that did come through from, uh, you know, NASA. And they are examining the extent of extreme weather across the world well extreme weather events will obviously increasingly uh, cluster in a close space and time but what is at stake and what has been threatened is agriculture well according to the new study the models combined effects rather than looking at the single climate indicators why are we having a decline in agriculture produce worldwide or even most of the crops being threatened by climate change now, with, uh, we've been in a nice age for at least 2.8 million years, and uh, the last glacier cycle was among the coldest ever recorded. But while we're looking at that, we are also having the, you know, so far, the biggest rise in temperatures of uh, our time has ever seen, because we do know that the curve is going up, and there has not been those numbers in the past. Just yesterday, we're looking at India having gone to 45 degrees Celsius, something they haven't seen in 122 years so meaning that every day we are breaking records of uh, you know increasing temperatures what is expected is to have more of these drought related uh, uh, cases and one of those obviously is affecting agriculture mostly you know if you look at the produce of maize I th that picture that is shown out there is uh, you know just maize dropping out because of extreme heat across the area and uh, for as far as we can remember, there hasn't been a case where we're looking at temperatures dropping due to, you know, climate change. All that climate change is doing is increase temperatures. So when we, we spread the gospel and say, hey, look, let's stop emission of greenhouse gases, gases into the atmosphere, we're trying to regulate those temperatures. Because in turn, the effect is now being, uh, you know, seen even on our daily practices, on our daily produce. And this could actually be posing a lot of danger in the future if we now have agriculture being threatened at such a level. Now, also closer looks that have been taken on by NASA from uh, space indicate that but even with some clusters across the area, across most areas across the world, indicate that even where we do have more of agricultural practices, like in the northern hemisphere, these are the areas where we're having temperatures even rise more. So that means that the, the impact will be felt directly onto our farms. And uh, by the year 2100, increase in heat, waves, drought, and excessive rainfall combined with, uh, will be doubled with a risk of climate-related failures of corn harvests in the last three of the world's six major corn-growing regions in the same year. 
So this is what is at stake and this is what NASA has analyzed to look into uh, the future of our agriculture. Well, the message is still the same. We need climate action, we need uh, climate justice, because uh, the sooner we treat this as an emergency, the sooner we'll be looking into more action. Otherwise, if we still look at it as something still far away from us, we're still going to have uh, the same roundabout of extreme weather events happening across the world. And before you know it, it is just at your doorstep. We have seen most of the extreme weather events here, even uh, in the country. But away from that, we want to take a look at what is happening over Uganda for this morning. We'll tap into your satellites. And uh, mostly we did start off with uh, cloudy weather, a little bit of sun across most areas within the country. But then again, we did have a rainy system uh, sweeping through across parts of central Lake Victoria, where you see those uh, green, yellow colors uh, close to Kampala. Now, we did have a lot of that spilling a bit of rains across parts of Kampala, across parts of Jinja, Lugazi area. But uh, fortunately, that system uh, seems to have moved away uh, towards more on the island of Lake Victoria that will be affecting areas of Kalangala. And looks like for now Kampala has cleared up and most of the areas within the central part of Lake Victoria seem to have cleared up. And uh, we could be looking at more, more of those rains developing later on, but also those will be just over a few areas. Now it looks like most areas within the country are having uh, quite sunny skies, but we'll go ahead and take a look into the forecast for today and also check on those numbers that we have uh, for this morning. But at least temperatures are striking, starting to warm up with uh, reduction in wet weather activities across most areas. We might be looking at quite a pleasant morning for most areas as uh, those temperatures go down. Now, the rainy systems do help, but that will be mostly over the southern sector. But northern Uganda will still be dealing with most of those uh, high conditions with temperatures, even as we look at uh, more dry conditions as we head into the afternoon. But for this morning, the Karamoja region around the central part of northern Uganda is looking at uh, mostly uh, quite sunny intervals although we have clouds developing especially for the western stretch but we also do expect some of those rains come through mostly during the afternoon that could also help to keep temperatures down the central part of the country is still having mostly sunny intervals so we could be looking at quite a warm day for today it's uh, you know a little bit of uh, concerning and maybe good news because we've been having a lot of rains across the central for the last couple of days so at least today brings in a little bit of warmth with temperatures uh, getting into the the, the, the top 20s and also across Lake Victoria Basin obviously we do know that there is an effect of Lake Victoria and that could be bringing us rains across several places uh, as the day continues. Well that is it in terms of weather for this morning I'll be leaving you with Good Morning Uganda agenda where Robert will come through to take you through that and later on we'll be having sports highlights as well but do remember that we are streaming live on YouTube that is UBC Television Uganda and of course you can catch us with uh, our conversations on social media the hashtag is uh, hashtag UBC GMU my name is Molin Kenyana I want to wish you a wonderful morning This is Good Morning Uganda. Total Energies has undertaken a number of initiatives aimed at ensuring that Ugandan entities and citizens are adequately equipped to participate in the oil and gas sector. Yeah, we do manufacture and supply personal protective equipment. Uh, we supply beyond Total Energies. We supply their subcontractors. Yeah, we have seen our company transform from uh, a trading company to a manufacturing entity. We are able to set up some, some of these facilities that we are enjoying right now. And these facilities also are supporting other sub-sectors. So they have no idea what oil and gas is, but the items they are using are a result of oil and gas overall the industry, manufacturers, suppliers, traders, we all enjoy. Total Energy's EP Uganda is committed to the empowerment of Ugandans to take an active part in the overall development of the oil project in Uganda. Even with my grandson, a doctor at my side, I struggled to get the help I needed. But he saw something that day. He began to work day and night. 
He wouldn't quit even when people said no. He wouldn't stop fighting. He knew something had to change and his vision was bigger than anyone could imagine. He made it possible to receive quality medical services anywhere in Uganda by simply using a phone. This is a story of a regular Ugandan just like you, who harnessed the power of technology to provide a solution for us. How about you tell us your story? Yuji needs more of you. To share your story, visit airtel.co.ug slash Yuji needs more of you or call or SMS 162. Airtel, the smartphone network. When you talk about our motherland Uganda, the pearl of Africa, you cannot fail to smile because of the smile that fills the faces of the citizens. Our nice good weather and nature that sustains us all, that enables us all to continue each in their own way because we are all different even according to each individual's work. But what joins us to become one person is the sweetness from the flavored drink Alleluia Jingati drink and Alleluia Tamarind drink. The flavor that quenches your thirst while at the same time treating and healing your body because it is 100% natural. Enjoy the drink that has got the tamarind juice in it. Made by Alleluia Reflexology, Healthy Solutions and Nutritional Research Center Limited. Get yourself a bottle of Alleluia from all shops around. Peak of the Day on UBC. Brought to you by... Authentically symbolic and insightful. We should work so hard to evacuate this power. Behind the headlines, every Wednesday at 10 p.m. with Charles Sodong Talk. How to get points? Just use MTN to make calls, send SMS, load airtime, buy bundles, or pay for MTN subscription services. Everywhere you go, MTN. Need to send money to a loved one but you don't have enough on your phone? Have you run out of fuel but you don't have enough money? Do you want to pay for yaka or water but have insufficient funds? Or do you want to shop but you don't have enough money? Don't worry. Get away with MTN Momo Advance. Momo Advance tops up your Momo to complete your transactions. Dial star 165 star. Five star three hash to apply. MTN Momo Advance is always available when you need it. The best entertainment for any budget. With Go TV, you will have great entertainment for as little as 13,000 Ugandan shillings per month. Go TV, great stories. City Wano, Go TV Uganda. Love it. We also have enough air. To it is intellectually engaging. And you can only become a leader when there are problems. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. The same applies to. To, to Rwanda, Burundi. So what are we federating? Whether rats from another country can be, I mean, someone must be, somebody must be there to hold everybody accountable. But at the moment, we would rather deal with what we have, make it right. First of all, we as elites of Uganda, have, we have made seven the issue. I can tell him seven is not the problem of Uganda. The problems of Uganda are much deeper. We can change the next 20 presidents and we'll still be this roundabout. Deeply incisive. The different political forces that, that we have in the country, in the, in the country we, we don't seem to really have achieved that you know, minimum political consensus over certain things. Authentically symbolic and insightful. Behind the headlines, every Wednesday at 10 p.m. with Charles Sodong To. All on your public broadcaster, UBC, inspiring Uganda. Pay for your dream phone, Mpola Mpola. Get your dream phone today for as low as 1,400 Uganda shillings with free data for a year and pay slowly, slowly. All phones come with daily 50 MBs for 12 months. Repayment period is one year. Available at MTN Service Centers and M Copper Shops.
live from Now Avenue in UBC Studios. This is Good Morning Uganda. seven minutes past the top of the hour. Thank you so much for keeping it with us here on UBC and Uganda, the Pearl of Africa. In case you're a visitor, please pro stay. We need that foreign exchange. Our weather is very complicated. It is raining, the other it is shining, the other it is moderate. And of course, there's plenty of food here. Why that? Because today we are going to be handling a topic that involves a lot of tourism. And we are going to be looking at the relevance or importance of museums and monuments in national development. Now, when we talk about museums, many think that Uganda have only one museum. Because it is where many, when we were young, we used to have these tours. So many, when you talk about museums, all they factor in is Chitante. We have our national museum. But Uganda has over 30 museums. We have institutional museums, cultural museums, and so much. But I won't bother to explain this. Yet I have the right man, and that is the Assistant Commissioner, Museums, Ministry of Tourism, and of course it looks at also wildlife and antiquities. And that is uh, Mr. Kizara Alfred Samuel, your most studios. Thank you, moderator. Uh, I want to thank you for having found time. I know right now you're very, very busy. Yes, indeed. Because you're gearing up for the International Museums Day that yes. is stated for 18th May globally. It is celebrated and our officials in that ministry, Ministry of Tourism, Wildlife and Antiquities, they are busy to ensure that they give this day all that it requires. Most of it is a week long of activities as they reach 18th. But to begin with, when you talk about museums, to a lay person, someone watching, uh, most of the times, what are we referring to? Uh, by museums, we are referring to places where objects of historical and cultural importance mm -hmm. are collected and kept for the benefit of the public. Museums history in Uganda go as far as the beginning of Uganda by the British Protectorate. The first museum collection started at Entebbe by during the Protectorate government. And that is one signal to show that museums are important. As soon as the government started, collection started. They raised awareness to the public to bring objects of relevance, objects of importance, significance to the country. The collection started, and that is, was the beginning of the National Museum of Uganda in 1908. When the collection accumulated, it came to Fort Lugard at Old Kampala. That was the big first museum of Uganda at Fort Lugard. Collection continued. And it is not a matter of collecting, but we collect objects of national importance. Mm -hmm. Bear in mind, of course, the fact that if they are left out there, then the national identity will be lost. Because these are beneficial to the present and the future. And that's why museums are very important in this country. Mm -hmm. Uh, having talked about their importance, now let's also understand how do you get these objects? Because recently I was seeing a skull of one of the fowls in Egypt that was discovered by a farmer. And it made news globally everywhere. So for Uganda's case, in case I come across a spear, how do you collect these things? Maybe I believe it was chintus or something. So how do you come up with these collections? And when you talk about museums, to help us understand, we will hear that National Museum. So what goes where, what comes where? Yes, at the National Museum, which I'm basically going to talk for as of now, 
we have staff and the staff we have are to have specialties they are trained the staff in the research in ethnology, in ethnography, in history, archaeology, paleontology, science, and industry. Mm, there's so much theology so, there. That's right. Mm. So, may, so many subjects are involved. So these are empowered to understand what is relevant to a country, and they must carry out research. An approach we use is in one way by use of the staff making research and move out to the respective ethnic groupings where these artifacts are found. Artifacts are found within the public in the villages there. And of course, we are very much aware that the villagers may not attach much relevance to them. So if it is left with them, it is bound to get deteriorated and lost. Another approach is when they realize that the staff will go to the villages and collect. They also take interest to pick and show, bring to us to find out whether something is relevant. So we can remunerate them for that purpose. And we always encourage them to collect whatever they, f they feel it has importance to the nation and bring to us. So it is a two-way approach. Of now quality. when you talk about importance to the nation, Help us understand. I've visited the National Museum. I've visited the Parliamentary Museum there. Uh, I've visited a cultural museum. Uh, in terms of religion, yes, I've visited Namugongo. There is a museum there. So how is this then of importance? Because apart from people coming and seeing, what other value? Why should someone uh, pay or why should someone labor to go to a museum? What do we benefit? Why should government give you lots of money every financial year to maintain these museums? You, the importance is in the fact that we need to appreciate our identity as a country. Mm -hmm. And where does our identity come from? Our identity comes from our ways of life. What, how do we behave? How do we live? How do we work? How do we benefit out of what we do, which equipment do we use, and therefore it has give, maybe given you prosperity because through your lifetime. And this should be given a story, history, and we learn about what happened in the first. You know, heritage is not uh, static, it's dynamic. Mm -hmm. What we are looking at modernity today did not come out of the blue, but it came out of those all the old technologies which the past used mm. to, 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 to use in their ways of life. That's why, and of course they tell stories, and the stories help you understand where you began from, where you are and where you should go. And uh, in one way or another, you need to uh, plan for your life as an individual to benefit out of that. So, if you are to do that, you have to go to the museum where uh, these items are kept and you understand the, 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 the continuity of life in the out there. Where did we begin from? Where do are we today? How should we look in the future? So it makes us become dynamic and prosperous. Mm. Now this brings me to the celebrations. That is the International Museum Day that is celebrated globally on the 18th of May. Uh, Uganda, we are going to be celebrating this. And I'm very informed that there is a week long of activities to celebrate this. First, what is the significance? And why as Uganda are we laboring even to be part of this international body and then invest so much in celebrating such a day? Yeah, that such a day is important to us as Uganda because it is creating awareness of the relevance of our cultures, the, 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 the importance of museums in the day-to-day -day life of man. Why should we not destroy our environment? Because most of what you will find in the museum came from natural objects, but there is a lot of destruction now. Environmental degradation is taking place. The indigenous trees are being cut. 
and yet these cultural objects come from those indigenous trees. These days, of course, since the time immemorial, the an example of a baka cloth is that it has been in use since our four forefathers and today people have even given the baka cloth more you know alternatives to make a crafts out of them and that is a way of earning and in the tourism of course we have we we, we 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 get tourists coming in who need some of the souvenirs and they get excited when they are given some of those local objects which are made locally by the common man and there are museums which inform people that it is a, a, a source of uh, employment you become self-employed you don't have to wait for employment to be employed by organizations or the government but you can create yourself jobs locally mm -hmm. at your tourism sites and that is where now we have the sites and monuments where tourists come in but we showcase in the museum and then we look to find that opportunities are there for the common man to benefit out of the museum services and that's why we celebrate this day because we are preserving our nature, our heritage, our culture. When you talk about celebrating this day, what are some of those activities? Uh, because, you know, museum things are about ancient days, things in history. And to the current generation where the world has gone uh, uh, so much in the digital world, I've seen an electronic museum. I don't know, you must have come across this commissioner yes. where everything is on the internet. Yes. You know, you do tourism, digital tourism, you visit a museum on the internet. Yes. And you don't have, but Uganda today, we go to premises, we go to places, sometimes you pay. Yeah, by a click of a button, a small subscription, then I've seen what happens. So, help us understand, with the world reaching this, this way, doing things this way, that now just my phone, I can see my computer, uh, what activities have you lined up to attract this current generation that may not find value in looking at the first spear Chintu used, first Muganda, may not find interest in knowing the first house Chintu slept in, or Kabaka Mutesa's house or something like that, because they are going global. They are looking at people building in space skyscrapers. So how are you... In, uh, thinking about this generation and attracting them to be interested? Yeah, the activities we have shall attract their, their attention in a way that we are moving towards modernization of the museum, mm -hmm. the digitization of the museum. As of now, as I speak, we have, of course, the websites for the museum and we are accessible from anywhere. But we want to go beyond that to ensure that when even you physically visit the museum, you can access anything on the, the, uh, via the audiovisual facility to explore the museum at one point when you are in the museum. We are also going to have uh, other museums to join us mm -hmm. so that people don't only think that there is going to be only the Uganda Museum in Uganda. No, there are museums we encourage because we take mm -hmm. care of them. They are going to be part of us in the temporary exhibition which you are going to hold from the 12th to 18th of May. They are showcasing their potential because the theme for this year, the international theme, is the power of the museum. And uh, we've localized ours as the power of the museums in the conservation of our culture. This power, we are going to show it. We shall have uh, areas where people access what we have digitally on computers, and they explore the museum. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we want to show them the benefits out of what we are keeping by giving them scripts that will show that these things came from the raw materials you look mm -hmm. after, We've kept them for over 40, 50 years or more, and they can be utilized like this, and they benefit you in your life. We are also going to demonstrate those indigenous games which used to be mm. played by our forefathers, the children of our forefathers, and they could be energized and even become more healthy 
than we are now. We shall have uh, a vintage drive which are mm. showcasing the museum collection which of significance showing the powers of the participating museums they are going to come from each museum mm -hmm. they will be rallied at parliament flagged off by the speaker of parliament mm -hmm. and drive to the uganda museum mm -hmm. we shall also have a we shall have a, mm -hmm. a, a route march from fort lugard which was our first museum here in uganda to Makerere School of Fine Art, which was the second museum, and mm. end up at the Uganda Museum to indicate the journey we've taken mm. since the beginning of museums in Uganda. There are a number of activities, like I said, even cultural dances shall be there. So we are encouraging everybody mm. to be part of us. And all of this we are going to participate in from 12th to 18th shall be you know, online in on various, you know, platforms. So everybody will be watching us. Yes. Very interesting. Uh, from the 12th, those are activities and uh, you've heard how the various activities are going to be carried on. Be part of that. But Commissioner, I also want to understand uh, when you look at our National Museum, for example, you've mentioned vantage cars. Mm. I enjoy watching mm. them. I enjoy those cars, very mm. expensive. But the ones I find in the museum, some are not even in good shape. Mm. I was looking at Mutesa's first, the other, the president, the cross country there, that lovely cross country. Mm. That's like some even, the tires are being worn out. What, yet some of these other precious uh, out of clay, out of stones. These are what is happening. You know, our museum has very relevant things, I must say. Mm -hmm. But maintenance in one or the other is not that very attractive. Why? No, no, no. no you see, when the, those the artifacts were brought to the museums, mm -hmm. we didn't have space for them. But we first kept them behind the museum. We created space for mm. them. And definitely they were being accessed by everybody, oh. including the school children, because mm. they are our biggest visitors in the museum. And they could touch them, do everything they could, until we had to construct a transport gallery where we transferred them to. But they were brought, apart from the recent ones, the presidential cars, the others came when they were artifacts really they were not in good shape mm. and we need to put them to good shape and make even one of them functional mm. that is the plan we have like the idea mini presidential vehicle is is very attractive to the public and yeah, it has like a story it. to sell mm. so we are going to put to, to, to renovate it mm. right now they are very safe where they are but of course they are in a state in which we brought them from the open air where they were, they were displayed. What are the initiatives uh, have you put in place to attract Ugandans to these museums? Because if you told our youth taking you to the beach, taking you out and visiting the museum, I wonder how many would go for the museum. So what are you doing? Because when you go there, you find more of uh, foreigners, very ashamed. People from the United States of America are interested to know about their heritage. They're interested to know how Ugandans were living 30, 50 years back compared to Ugandans. So how are you ensuring you boost this? COVID taught us a lesson that sometimes we may not yes. thrive on foreign visitors. Yes. We need to have domestic tourism boosted. What initiatives are you doing? We've encouraged domestic tourism. We are, the approach we are making is to reach out to the free people, to make outreaches, mm -hmm. not to rely on waiting for visitors to come to us. We are moving to the schools, who are our biggest visitors, to, 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 to give real awareness of what museums are, why they are there, what they keep. They have items that are part of their curriculum, and right now the new curriculum in the lower classes is really part of it is 
taught in is, is found in the museum. The old the items are found in the museum, the stories on Stone Age and so we are making outreaches. We've also established regional museums and we are trying to equip them with artifacts according to their localities. We have one in Soroti, another one is in Kabale, Moroto Museum. We plan to establish one in, in Fort Porto and Arua mm. to make services closer to the people. Mm. And the, the other way we are saying that we are going digital definitely. We don't want to wait for people to come to the National Museum. Mm. We want them to access us from wherever they are. And of course, in one way or another, they have to subscribe. And that is still revenue which will be coming in. So initiatives are there that people can access us from wherever they are and not necessarily come to the Uganda Museum. Yes. Very interesting. And uh, viewers, we are still looking at uh, museums and monuments, their relevance, their importance towards national development. And of course, we know that this generation has not taken so much to understand. One time I was moving with a friend around Sheraton. We have the Independence Monument. And I, and I asked him, what is that about? I was like, I don't know. OK, I told him, when you look at that monument, what do you understand this young kid being lifted by this lady? And I challenge you, our viewer, how many of you know what the message behind that monument? Yes, you pass there every day, but if someone asked you what was the communication in that monument, many will find that they may not know. Even someone just ask them, where's the Independence Monument? Maybe today they have, I think, put a wording on that. Yeah. I think the there's some there. wording, Independence Monument. It has always been But there. previously, some of us went to Nakasero Primary School, you would pass there and ask, what you know, the tea. So it is very important that you get to know uh, where you came from, your origin, the way of life, and museums do this very much. One man once said, a person who does not know their history then doesn't know where they are going. That is the Independence Monument. And uh, yes, if you can go on our Twitter page or go on our various social media platforms, I just want the meaning, the meaning of that child being held. What, was it, what message were they communicating? communicating? The people who came out with that monument. What message were they communicating? That young child being held. It is the Independence Monument but what message is being communicated there by that time? These are some of the things you get to know when you visit the museum or when you uh, just challenge your mind to understand because there's so much message in that child being lifted, lifted. on the day that monument was put up, as we call it, the Independence Monument. Back to you, uh, Sinistat Commissioner. Uh, you've talked about the activities that are going to be carried out as we uh, celebrate International Museum Day. And uh, we know we are joining the rest of the world. But we want to understand still. When you talk about such days, you've explained it to the youth. But as a country, what do we benefit? You know, if it is a conference, we know. You're going to have visitors, hotels are going to make money. You know, people go to international conference. But these celebrations, what do we benefit? Yeah, Uganda is a member of the International Council of Museums. Mm -hmm. International Council of Museums is the international organization that looks after all museums, gives them technical assistance, gives them guidance on how to care for the museums. We, when we, we celebrate such days, yeah. we are creating awareness, not only internally, locally here, but globally, okay. that we exist. And we have these things. We have these things. And therefore, mm -hmm. they should come and feel them, experience them, mm -hmm. and take, you know, the message home, back home, mm -hmm. that Uganda is gifted by nature. Mm. It has these natural objects. Mm. So, Ignatian definitely will benefit out of that. Mm. Whoever has not come to Uganda before will have to look for a way mm. of visiting Uganda. And when he visits Uganda and visits the Uganda Museum, 
Then the National Museum illustrates whatever is happening in the entire nation. The opportunity will be there for them now to visit even those sites out there. Mm. And them, those will be more days spent in Uganda by the foreign tourists. So we're having visitors that are coming in for these celebrations? They are coming in okay. because we contact uh, embassies are part of our partners, the French Embassy for instance, British High Commission. So they create awareness mm. and visitors come in. Mm -hmm. And the French are, have been very instrumental in the helping us uh, explore the archaeology and paleontology part of mm. our country. Mm. Yes. Now when you talk about archaeology and paleontology part of our country, let's understand how do we protect this? Because I'm also told that most of these things have value attached to them. Indeed. Monetary value. Monetary value. <laughs> I've read a number of stories where museums are robbed. Uh, people want these precious things. I don't understand where the market is. I don't. But how do we protect that that is in the community? For example, I know uh, the National Museum, what is there maybe is guarded. But I want to believe there are still some of these things that are out there. One time I uh, was told even some people, some of what we treasure to have in our museums, some prefer them for cultural purposes. They are greatly needed. So how do we protect these things? These archaeological and paleontological mm. materials mm. are underground. Mm -hmm at certain levels mm. and those sites where we know they exist mm. we've created awareness mm -hmm. of their relevance mm. a local man may not see much relevance of those collections mm. and get you know anxiety to maybe s dig and sell them because you will not sell them mm. anywhere mm. apart from bringing them maybe to the uganda museum mm -hmm. we have uh, gazetted sites where we know these precious collections are. Mm. I'll give you an example. We have on two sea mounds. Mm. There are those we call a female mound and male mound. And then the Bigovia Mugeni mm. site. Uh, the Chuezi sites. Mm. Those are places of, you know, early civilization. Mm. Where we have examples of early civilization. Where men, the people at that time, knew the leadership and the care of their subjects. The subjects were at Intusi, they collected garbage and heaped yeah. heaps of garbage. Of course, when they are staying, surviving in a place, they have to make a, they have utensils to use. Yeah. Then these have become now archaeological materials. Yeah. And we have caretakers who look after them. Yeah. And that's how we protect yeah. them. The same to other sites. We have uh, near local paintings. Mm. Yes, they are protected. Mm -hmm. But the common man is only vandalizing. Mm -hmm. Vandalism is inevitable. Sometimes they are looking for survival because they don't understand the value of the stones that uh, mm -hmm. the near local paintings. Mm -hmm. So they want to, to query and get money out of it. Mm -hmm. But where we know that these are of uh, significance to us, we are protecting them. Mm. Yes. Very uh, interesting there, protection. Of course, uh, there's also uh, fears of some of these sites over time perishing, not only by vandalization, but people also having interest in these particular sites for either economic activity mm -hmm. or owning them. Now, let's look at the money aspect of it. When you talk about some of these sites, uh, we talk about the museum. How do we make value away from the visitors that just come and pay? I'll give an example still under your ministry. Today, our government is finding ways of giving some portion of land to people within these game parks, mm -hmm. setting up hotels. By the end of the year, there are they, they some subscription that they are giving to help these ministries run uh, the museum uh, at some time. I don't know if this was part of the museum arrangement. I see concerts, funny bucket, is it a bucket? Not so much into that uh, blanket and wine, whatever it is, uh, in the museum premises. So how do we ensure it's not only storage and a few pennies that come in, but there is something meaningful to sustain these uh, museums 
because most of them you reach there. You feel, are there initiatives you've taken? To sustain the museums mm. or the communities around No, 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 I'm them. talking about the museums. Many of them, because even when you go to those that are either cultural, you, know, you find that mm -mm, having these things put here and waiting for once in a while, someone to come and, and pay a small token. How do we think outside the box to see that this somehow we better generate income? Yeah, we are looking at, that we are celebrating to, mm. to, to, to make awareness that we should be self-sustaining. Mm. We should do make, should have some other projects mm. which should do back up mm. what we are collecting and what we intend to get from say government mm. that we sustain ourselves. We need to equip some of these museums. They, are, they, they, are, they have potential, they have mm. potential. Like say Kabale is a tourism site, is a tourism region, and we have a museum there. It has potential because in, according, naturally there are natural sites where tourists go to visit, and they should also visit the museum. What we need is to equip them much more than they are. To study what is in the villages, within the communities, what is very relevant to them, and then if we to showcase it in our museums. That is one of the ways we should do that. But also to have other income generating activities. You should not wait for visitorship to the museums. But if we have a wider compound, then we should have other activities to, to, be, to take place in, the, in those premises so that they generate revenue and sustain the museum. Mm. Yes. Uh, Commissioner, in the interest of time, let me just have your final remarks regarding uh, museums and monuments in this country, but also the International Museums Day. Yeah, viewers, museums and monuments in this country are what makes Uganda their identity. They show us, how they market us out of, out of outside there what we are the uniqueness of Uganda, why somebody should visit Uganda and not another country. And therefore, there is very great, much importance attached to their care so that they are not demolished, they are not deteriorated, but they are maintained and even upgraded to a better standard. We are going to celebrate the International Museums Day and the International Museums Week this year, this, ma this month of May from 12th to 18th. And the main venue is at the Uganda Museum. We've um, arranged a series of activities that should be, uh, that should uh, give coverage to everybody out there. And we've made all arrangements to make sure that we reach them out on social media, via radio talks and via, you know, TV shows like this one. And we are encouraging the public to come and understand why museums are there, why they should be kept, why they should be visited, what are their values to the communities, because they are not only places that keep all the things as they take it, but we keep educative material, and we are moving ahead to educate people on how they should be self-sustaining out there. They make use of the local materials they have, they make use of the trees they have to make crafts out of them and therefore get more money than looking for employment. Craft shops are existing because of the natural, the natural objects, the natural materials we have out there. So by cutting them for charcoal and, the, and other use is making, uh, you know, the degrading the, the environment. Come on from 12th for an exhibition which is going to be for Uganda Museum and other museums who are participating. Other activities are there, including the cultural dances, the vintage shows, which are going to have showcase the museum collections of the, their power in their museums from the respective museums. We have a route march from Fort Lugard to the National Museum. We have the main celebration on that day, which we, we invited and we expect the guest of honor to be His Excellency, the President of the Republic of Uganda. Mm. So you are all invited to come to the museum 
and celebrate together with us. Museums are for the people. Mm. Thank you, Assistant Commissioner. Museums, that is Ministry of Tourism, Wildlife and Antiquities. That is a Samuel Alfred Kizara. Thank you so much for your Thank time. You, uh, we just hope that Ugandans will be interested in knowing more regarding their heritage, their history, and how those that lived before us managed to make use of the environment so that we pick a leaf from them and also use such materials to uh, gain financially. Like when you talk about the back cloth, one of the things they'll tell you, it was a culture, it was what they used to put on most so in Buganda. Today, how are you making use of the back cloth? To earn a living, for them money wasn't the issue, it was butter trade maybe. But for you of this generation, when we look at the iron ore that they used to have the spears and these cooking tools, you of this generation, how are you adding on the knowledge you've gotten mm. to better that of your great, great, great parents to earn a living? Have a lovely day. God bless you. Thank you. Live from Now Avenue in UBC Studios. This is Good Morning Uganda. The best entertainment for any budget. With Go TV, you will have great entertainment for as little as 13,000 Uganda shillings per month. Go TV, great stories, Zidiwano. Go TV.